Uh, I have uh, spent so much of my life in hotels. Uh, I've been on the road professionally a ton, uh, particularly in the last decade or so. And you know the hotel life if you've lived it. There are tiny little shampoo bottles. Uh, there's bottled water that's $4 a piece if you choose to get one. Uh, there are miniature coffee makers. Uh, it's the hotel life. They're all pretty much the same after the first hundred. And this last Thursday, Jen was at a retreat for ministers and was uh, needing a driver and luggage handler. I was available. <laughs> and so we ended up in another city, and she was at sessions, uh, being with people and being famous and a rock star and all this. And I was alone in another hotel room uh, with my little shampoo bottles. And so uh, late in the evening, uh, all my work was done. I couldn't think of anything else to work on. Uh, I don't really feel like chatting with people on the internet if there's nothing really to talk about. And so the TV was on, and uh, I had uh, an experience uh, called Jersey Shore. <laughs> For the wow. first time, I watched my very first actual episode of this program. Now, of course, I've heard of it, because who hasn't? Uh, I've seen fragments of it, bits and pieces. It's come up in conversation. I've seen some of the t-shirts. I have never seen this program in my life. I feel like I'm the last man in the world to get the word about this. Have you seen this before? No. Uh, and it, it it's, uh, starts in about 2009. This is MTV's most popular program. So popular, it has been exported to dozens of countries. In 2010, Barbara Walters called the cast part of her 10 most fascinating people in the world. This program has so much influence that the University of Chicago and the University of Oklahoma, in addition to other schools, both teach whole courses about it or offer conferences on it. And it has introduced all kinds of new expressions into our uh, national language, which are fairly controversial. Uh, I watched this, and I have to tell you that uh, I had a defining moment. This, what, it gave me questions. Uh, like, how could a good God let this happen? <laughs> uh, questions like, with this in our popular culture, does it really matter who wins the next presidential election? And yeah. should we all, should television just be outlawed? Really, I, I mean, I'm going to, 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 to things yeah. like that. And my, my whole, uh, I, I'm not saying I've reached conclusions about this, but I mean, it shook me. I wasn't really, I've seen a lot of things, but I, I just couldn't understand the huge power of, of this what now inter international enterprise, which features eight people who insist on working in a t-shirt shop despite the fact that the program has made them fabulously wealthy. So you try to do the math and work all that out. Uh, defining moments don't all happen on television, though. Mostly we think of points in history like that as kind of the big events. Uh, things like the Battle of Marathon, where the Greeks turned back the Persians in 490 uh, in their first invasion, or something like D-Day, which you know is Saving Private Ryan, where the Allies begin the liberation of Europe from the Nazis, or uh, Apollo 11 puts the first human being uh, on the moon, uh, Facebook, Google, things that redefine everything else uh, in the world. To really be a kind of large-scale defining moment, really your moment has to have been made into a major motion picture. And that's how you know that it was really a, a powerful thing. Uh, one blogger recently listed the 10 most important defining moments of the 2000s so far. Let's see if you agree with these. Uh, number 10 was the final Harry Potter book being released in 2007. That, that, was, a, mm -hmm. that was a big deal. Uh, number nine was the 2001 debut of the program Pop Idol, which is now spun off into blah, 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 Idol, many other ways. Number eight was the release of Slumdog Millionaire in 2008, winning multiple Academy Awards from a very unlikely starting point. Number seven, the Boston Red Sox comeback that began in 2004. I don't care about baseball, so that one I think is wrong. Uh, number six, 2001, the introduction of the iPod. Do you, you may not remember the world before the iPod, but there was one, and that one is really a big deal. Number five, of course, Facebook launches in 2004. That's uh, enormous. Uh, number four, uh, the euro is adopted in 2002. That was defining. That changed a lot of things. 
Uh, number three, uh, this one you know would have to be on the list, is 9-11. Uh, number two is the tsunami of 2004. And for this particular blogger, the number one defining event of the first 10 years of the millennia is uh, the election of Barack Obama mm -hmm. in 2008. That at least in American politics, that shifted mm -hmm. everything. Yeah. Now, a lot of defining moments really in our lives aren't really this public. Uh, it's very unlikely they'll be made into a major motion picture. But if you've ever made a choice where lots of people either said, that is so wonderful for you, or lots of people said, you're so crazy to do that, you've probably had a defining moment. Mm -hmm. You may have both of those groups speaking to you simultaneously. Mm -hmm. Because the crossroads at which you stand is the one that changes everything mm -hmm. that comes thereafter. It not only defines us in terms of revealing what's actually in us, but it has a tendency to define all of the other moments that come subsequently. When we decided to first come and look at Berkeley, we had no idea that that would be a defining moment for us. What could go wrong? It was just another road trip. We came here with every intention of looking at the city, turning down the prospect of planting a church and going home. Mm -hmm. uh, we just made the mistake of getting on the airplane. Mm -hmm. And that decision turned out to be the thing that changed everything. And we heard from both camps, how wonderful for you that you're mm -hmm. doing this thing here, you know, so very late in life. You're getting into this whole thing. And we heard from the other camp that said, you've got to be completely out of your mind. Why, at this point, very late in your life, you should be a, well, just fill in the blank with whatever, but not that, because that's not what people do. I think my very first one happened in the eighth grade when I was made the narrator of my public speaking class musical. I was made the narrator because our director determined I could not sing and I could not act, and it was the only thing left. I wasn't strong enough to be on the stage crew. I was worthless there, too. So he made me the narrator, and the night of the premiere, when I said the very first word to my very first audience under my very first spotlight, standing behind my very first lectern in my very first costume, I knew that whatever I did for the rest of my life, I wanted it to involve public presentations to groups. That moment changed every other moment that came after that. Defining moments are in everybody's life. And because Jesus has come as one of us, he came as a human, they were in his life as well. Probably the most significant and famous one uh, of uh, his uh, very brief life here among us took place uh, not in a building or in a temple or in an auditorium. It took place in a garden, a place where olive trees were grown, a place that we call Gethsemane. Uh, Jesus was very close to the end. He had taught, he had healed, he had raised the dead, he had put his hands on lepers, he had spat in the dirt, made mud, put it into the eyes of the blind. He had heard the cries of the marginalized. He had spoken truth to power. He had called his religious enemies all kinds of names. He had engaged in major trash talk about the people who thought of themselves as the most holy and the most righteous, who, the people who had robes of wealth and power around them. And Jesus confronted them and said, all you've got is style. All you've got is, is, is looks like you're, you're like a, a, a grave, a tomb that's all covered in whitewash on the outside, but inside you're full of corruption and death. Well, that kind of talk doesn't get you very positive results from people who are powerful. And so a critical mass of opposition had built to the point where the envy of him held by the religious leaders and the fear of him held by those who thought if he started a revolt, the Roman occupiers would come down on first century Palestine like thunder and lightning to restore order. All of that created a perfect storm that was pointing him towards death by crucifixion, the preferred method of execution by the Romans who occupy Palestine during this time. Jesus arrives at the city of Jerusalem. He enters it to great acclaim. You remember the story, the 
followers went out and rounded up a ride for him, a small donkey at his instruction, and they put their clothing on the back of the beast, and he he mounted it, and he enters the city not with, with chariots and armies like a conqueror or like the Roman general Titus would do not too many decades later, but he enters the city riding on a small donkey, defenseless, and yet the crowds, recognizing who he is, shout, Hosanna! In the highest they announce him as not only the son of David but as the prophet of God and he lets them do it this makes his enemies even more furious because the Bible records that even the children are crying him out you know there is no hype chart on faith even the kids could see who he was and could verbalize what was in their hearts he went to the temple He's offended the religious authorities completely. Now he offends the business authorities when he drives corrupt business people out, denying them the income they were receiving from worshipers by way of what amounted to a kind of economic extortion. He teaches in the temple extensively. He heals the sick. He opens blind eyes. And at the end of it all, with the end almost upon him, with his arrest just about there, he gathers his followers together. They go back out of the city quietly to a hillside not too far from the walls. And in this hillside is located the garden. He leaves most of them on the edge, takes a small handful of them farther into the garden, and then in a more secluded place, he prays. Mark's account of Jesus' life gives us the details of what happened in chapter 14, beginning at verse 32. And they went to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch and going a little further, he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. Jesus is going to Jerusalem to face his destiny voluntarily. No one is forcing him to do this. He's about to give up his life because he wants to. And now at the final moment, just before Judas, the man who would betray him, brings the temple police to arrest him and take him away to his illegal trial and his illegal condemnation and his illegal execution, one final opportunity to go back to God and say, Father, if there's, if there's any other way this can happen, if there's even a remote possibility of plan B, if there's some alternative route that would produce the same goal, if that's possible, could we do that? Now, thousands of people were crucified by the Romans, so many that some of observers say that this is one of the reasons why, for the, the lack of uh, forests and trees in the region, even today, because so many were cut down to build crosses. But none of them are crucified carrying the full weight of the sin and pain and illness of the world on their body while they die. And none of them go to that cross with a completely blameless personal life. And none of them go to that cross with one spoken word away from being able to summon a legion of angels to deliver them from that moment ex execution and rain down death and destruction on the very authorities that would have nailed him there. No one ever goes to the cross the way Jesus went to the cross. And facing that, all of the scriptural accounts together record that he went back to the Father three different times. And in the process, the strain and the stress of it was so great that the capillaries in his skin began to release drops of blood through his pores because of the physical exertion, the, the, the distress that he speaks of, his distress, capital D. His soul is wrenched within him over what he's about to face. Man, it's good to know you can tell God the truth. And he still goes to the cross blameless. 
There is nothing you can't say to God. There is nothing that he has not heard. And in this moment, with blood tarnishing his skin, maybe soaking through some of his garments at points, and his bra must have been covered with perspiration and clenched fists. I, I, I can't imagine. I've never seen this kind of exertion in my entire life. And he has thrown himself into the dirt, the dirt that God originally created people from. And face down, he's crying out if there's any other way. This is Jesus' defining moment. What happens here now affects every other moment that will ever come for every other person because this is the final off-ramp. If he takes this, no one knows what happens. If he does it, the police are already on the way to arrest him. He has minutes. But you don't get to a defining moment like that in one step. Jesus didn't get there in one step. It's a process many times of coming to those moments in ways that are built on other moments that we've already lived. Maybe the first one of those has to do with Let's do that. I think it's the battery. If you just want to turn the wireless one off. Heartbeat switch. sounds. Let's switch. There we go. Is that better? Yeah. No, nope, it's going to fall through. That's going to roll off. Thank you. Maybe the most amazing thing about uh, Jesus' life is that he comes out of nowhere. I mean, we're all familiar with the Christmas narratives and Bethlehem and angels and stars, but the truth of, that, of it is that uh, very few people actually saw any of those things. And then after they take place for 30 years, he goes into the witness protection program. I mean, he just disappears. And he lives in total obscurity in this nothing Roman garrison town called Nazareth. And for those three decades, uh, all we really know about him, with one small exception, is that he grows in wisdom, in stature, that is physically, and in favor with, with God and people. In other words, he grows up pretty much really the same way that anybody else begins to grow up. And then he, he reaches some point, and we don't know exactly what triggers this, when he knows that it's time to begin doing things in public. And you know, often what defining moments do is they propel you from a private reality to a more public reality. They bring you from what it is between just you and God in your own life into some kind of larger connection with other people. And that's the first thing that, that happens to him here. Remember his cousin John one day when he saw him walking by points to him and says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He, he identifies him for the first time in public in terms of who he is and what he has come to do. And then when, when Jesus decides that it's time for that public thing to happen, he goes back to his cousin and uh, who is out in uh, the wilderness where the Jordan River is flowing, baptizing people for repentance from sins. And the cousin, he's a little prickly. Uh, lots of people who come to him to be baptized, he flat turns them away. He says, what are you coming here, you snakes, you vipers? He really knew how to get up a crowd. You, you, you should bear fruits in keeping with repentance. In other words, you don't come to me with this religious style business and think because I make you wet that somehow you're more uh, in tune with God or you've got God's approval because now you're a wet hypocrite. Why don't you just keep being a dry hypocrite and just go home and leave me alone? And let people who really are humble in their hearts and really are contrite and broken, let them come and I'll baptize them. And so uh, he had problems with this attitude. And so Jesus shows up, who, who in whom is, is, is no fault, yeah. in, in whom is, is no blame, someone the Bible compares to a lamb right. without blemish, not a spot. What, what a lovely image. He comes with that kind of soft, blameless, un, unruffled, unmarred kind of 
total person that he brings, and he asks John we, to baptize him, and, and uh, the prickly John says, no. I would probably be prickly too if I were dressed in camel hair and a leather belt and ate nothing but honey and bugs, which we know is his diet. I'd probably be upset. And he says, uh, I'm not going to do this. There's just no way because he knows who he is. He's the one who's announced it. And Jesus says, I've got to do this to fulfill all righteousness. In other words, I'm, I'm not doing this for me. I'm doing this for the world. I, I'm going to identify with the people I've come to save so completely that I'm even going to share the waters of the Jordan with them because on the cross, I'm actually going to take on all of their sin, all of their death, all of their darkness, all of their addictions, all of their pain, all of their, all the secrets, all those terrible secrets. I'm going to take them all on myself physically in this body. So believe me, identifying them with them in the waters of baptism is not going to be a problem. John relents. He baptizes Jesus, and the scripture records when he comes up out of the water that the skies boom out. Behold, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. It's the voice of the Father. And the Father, in this defining moment, announces not only the identity, but his abject approval of his Son in a way that I love very much. And that way is this. He does it before Jesus has had a chance to do anything. Some defining moments are not our choice. God just shows up in your life and he just turns the apple cart over. He just bombs in, identifies what you are, sends you on a direction, and, uh, you know, we joke here all the time about God does stuff that we don't condone. And this is just kind of that sort of moment where there's simply no way in which anything that I've done plays into receiving his sanction. You know, this is a lovely thing because it means that we never have to work to achieve approval. Right. That God doesn't grant approval yeah. in return for accomplishment. Yeah. That our relationship with God is not a transaction. Yeah. It's not transactional. It's transformational. It's something in which we're changed, but in which his love is on me, his love is for me, his face is toward me before I get out of bed in the morning. You see why they call it good news? Because in this highly competitive, high-octane, high-impact, high-trajectory culture that we live in in the East Bay, everything comes by accomplishment. All the rewards are by accomplishment. Everything is a product of my abilities and my hard work, not this. God simply shows up and says, I'm for you. Mm -hmm. I'm for you. How about I got to be in my midterm? My parents threatened me to cut off my financial aid. I remember that moment. It was a Spanish class. And God simply says, I'm for you. I'm for you. I'm with you. I'm on your side. That's defining. Because that changes what everything else means. What that means is no matter what, I've got something in my life that nothing can take away. That no failure, no lack of accomplishment, uh, no missing a financial aid, no promotion I didn't get, nothing can pull that out of my life. Jesus has gone public, and the Father has simply shown up and defined him. Maybe the next one happens right after. His baptism, it's recorded in Luke's account of Jesus' life. And you would think that as soon as God has said, this is my beloved son, everything would be wonderful. Uh, as is so often the case after this sort of initial kind of defining moment is imparted for you, things immediately become terrible. And Jesus is led by the Holy Spirit out into the wilderness, into the desert, to be tempted by Satan. And for 40 days, he's fasting. 
And at the end of these 40 days, when he's weak, when he's, he, he's drained, when he's at his lowest ebb physically, maybe the time that would be second only to the crucifixion itself in terms of the physical demands and mental demands on, on his, his body and soul, uh, he's out in the middle of nowhere, no one to support him, and uh, Satan shows up and says, you know, you see those rocks? Got to be hungry after 40 days. Yeah. If you say the right word, those rocks will turn into New York City bagels mm. with cream cheese. <laughs> Sesame New York City bagels toasted mm. with cream cheese. Maybe a coffee on the side. Just all you have to do is say it. You know you can do it. You know you can. And Jesus tells him, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Mm -hmm. And he shoves him back. I read that passage and I thought, this is a second kind of defining moment where what God has done in you is now put to the test. These moments come at points of weakness, points of extremity, especially points of fatigue, times when our natural resources are so drawn down that we don't have the assets we would have normally to stand up to these things, and times, too, when we have a minimum of personal support. That's when the enemy of our soul, that's when the devil will come against us and say, look, you know, you don't really have to do all of this. You could just, you could go this, you know you can do it. You can go this other way, everything will be all right. Why, you, you can have an entire career turning rocks into bagels, it'll be wonderful. You can get a big crowds and a huge business, you know, go online, awesome. Just, you, you know, it'll all be good. Defining moments tend to come in those sorts of times and we, we, we are what we do when we're weak. That's the real us. Maybe if there's a third one that builds up towards Gethsemane in the life of Jesus, it happens sometimes after the wilderness temptation, which Jesus has successfully resisted after several attempts by Satan. He finally uh, vanquishes Satan off in the, into the wilderness where uh, the Bible records that he is going to await another opportunity, which seems to come back later on with Judas and the betrayal of Jesus and, and the arrest that's about to take place in the garden. But between those two things, uh, there's another occurrence where Jesus is doing miracles. It gathers a huge crowd, about 5,000 men, plus probably women and children. Uh, they're all in an area where there's nothing to eat. Everybody's hungry. The disciples are whining. We've got this big group together. Uh, everyone is uh, just so, they're grumbling. Their stomachs are empty. What are we going to do? And uh, the Lord asks them, well, what assets do we have? And they say our major weapon is a small boy who has a few loaves and some fishes. And uh, taking those in his hands, Jesus multiplies those, feeds all of them with 12 baskets of leftovers, which is absolutely unbelievable. And in the wake of this enormous miracle and all the other signs he had done before, uh, the people from this crowd come to him and say, uh, under their breath, their words aren't recorded, but we are made to understand from the gospel account that Jesus is aware of this, that they want to make him the king. Apparently, his miracles have energized the base. He's ready to uh, pull together this political group, these people believe. And Jesus then becomes the king who, who vanquishes the Romans, drives them out, restores the nation of Israel, uh, almost as if he's their superhero. And he's going to use these superpowers of his to accomplish what they've been unable to accomplish with guerrilla warfare and civil wars and uh, this kind of thing. And uh, this is what every presidential contender in America right now is praying for. This is why we're having primary elections. Everybody wants to be the right. king. Right. And uh, Jesus has it in his hand and says, no, I don't think so. And goes into hiding so they can't find him and make him become the king. The other way that defining moments come isn't when we're weak, it's when we're strong. And just at that moment, 
when we've got maximum stuff going on, someone will show up with an alternative theory of what we should be. You know, somebody with the kind of giftedness you have shouldn't be. <laughs> you, you, you could do so much better. You'd be the king. Really? Really, don't, don't serve God. Don't go to school. You know, don't, don't reach out to people. Don't, don't worry about nice and all this. Don't, don't be involved in a church plan. You, somebody, you could do. You know what I tell people when uh, they ask me, so what are the people at 360 like? Uh, I say two things. Uh, one is, have you seen the show Big Bang Theory? <laughs> and because uh, it's the smartest group of people I've ever seen in my whole life. And the other thing that I say is, uh, everybody we have could be doing way better somewhere else. That's really the thread that runs through the whole group. And that's really kind of what it takes to be part of something like this. Everybody here could do way better somewhere else. So these folks come, where's Jesus? We, we want to make him the king. We, we, we bought a crown. We're ready to go. We have enough of this here to make at least a small army, 5,000 men. Uh, that's two-thirds of a, a, an infantry division. You know, let's, let's do it. And he not only says no, he simply disappears because even in this moment of tremendous support, he knows this is the same crowd that will shout, give us Barabbas, mm -hmm. and then crucify him. And he simply says, no, I know what I'm here for. And I'm not going to be the king. In the garden, Jesus concludes his prayer time this way in Mark 14, verse 36. After he has thrown himself on the ground and prayed with such earnestness, he says, and he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. The defining moments of your life will be the moments when you decide whose will is priority. Mm -hmm. You're going to be tested in moments of weakness and tested in moments of strength. Mm -hmm. Both can be equally dangerous and both can be equally wonderful. But in both of those, the question will be, Whose will is priority? If I embrace the plan and will of God, that's going to define every moment that comes after that. And if I don't, somewhere down the line, I'm going to have to reboot my life in some way to try to get it back on track. My plea to you is simply to to live every day to get ready for these moments because when they're on you, it's too late to prepare. To embrace God's will every day in small things and small ways, to be in a relationship with God every day in small things and small ways, to, to love God, to love people, to reach out with your whole heart and put your arms around God in love and let him put his arms around you in faith so that when those crossroads come, in strength and weakness, you're ready. Because if they if they ambush you, jump on you out of the bushes, and that preparation is in place, it's too late to do it then. And all of your moments after that could be decided in the wrong direction by a lack of preparation before the times of strength and weakness when we all have to make those choices. Probably my biggest one was in a hotel with little shampoo bottles and a tiny coffee maker and a refrigerator that ran so loudly you couldn't sleep at night and four dollar bottle of water at Disneyland. And it was in that hotel room I had to decide uh, at the age of 26 between the two best jobs in my academic discipline at the time and this. Mm -hmm. and you, and us, and here, and this. And reading the Bible in that hotel room, God illuminated a passage to me that made it clear 
what I was supposed to do. It's not to say that one was right and one was wrong. It's just one was a closer approximation to God's plan for us than the other would have been. And uh, I had to walk out of that hotel room and go tell a couple of people that I wasn't going to take either of those positions. But I was leaving uh, the academic world and going to into something called the ministry, which resulted in a lot of, are you kidding? You're going to, accompanied by eye rolling and heavy sighing. Mm. From the vantage point of the hotel room I was just in, where I saw Jersey Shore, looking back on the hotel room where that decision was made and connecting those two points, uh, I have to say two things. One is what a long, strange trip it's been. Uh, and the other is I wouldn't change anything. I wouldn't change anything. I wish I had gotten all my defining moments right. I haven't. But what it's really about is getting the big ones right. If we get those right, the other moments are going to be defined in a way that's consistent with what God wants for you to give you the best life you could ever possibly have. I'm going to ask you to stand with me, if you would, please. And Ben's going to come and lead us in just a, a, a little more worship. And uh, as he does, uh, if, if you've got a, a defining moment in hand in your life right now, maybe a, a decision you need to make or some uncertainty you have to deal with, uh, maybe you're uh, you know, under pressure from one of those two sides of a do this, don't do that. You know, you're in kind of one of those places. We'd like to be able to pray with you this morning. Just ask the Lord to really help you with that, give you clarity and direction, and to make this uh, a season where uh, you come out of it feeling like, yes, I've, got, I've gone in the right direction, and I know that uh, now I'm on the right path in terms of where I need to be. So as Ben prays if, uh, place, if you'd like to uh, have someone pray with you about that kind of uh, moment, I'm just going to ask you to find a, a place over here to the left or the right, and uh, some of our uh, leaders of common will pray with you today, and we'll be back in just a minute.